The film you just bared witness to was captured on July third, nineteen sixty-eight. It was filmed by an amateur filmmaker by the name of Frank Mills. The site, London Heathrow Airport. This plane photographed here had crashed at one of the busiest airports in the entire world. The accident involved the ill-fated plane crashing into a terminal building and damaging three other planes in the process. The curious case of BKS Air Transport Flight C six eight four five involves the breakdown in the relationship between the pilot and a key aspect of controllability when flying an aircraft. This is a plane crash that is not all that well known even in the United Kingdom, despite the fact that it crashed into an airport building, killing most of its occupants. So what went wrong here? Well, to begin with, let's establish the nature of this flight. As flight C six eight four five was what you could consider to be an unusual one, given what was actually on board the plane, and some people, especially some in the United Kingdom, may already be familiar with one name attached to this disaster. July third, nineteen sixty-eight, a prop liner was flying between Deauville in France and London Heathrow. The aircraft was owned and operated by a company called BKS Air Transport. BKS were the initials of the airline's founders. This was a Newcastle-based airline that flew a variety of planes in its day, some of which were leased out and converted into freighters. One of these converted aircraft happened to include a British-built Airspeed Ambassador. The Airspeed Ambassador was a piston-propeller plane from the 1940s. It entered service with British European Airways. As an airliner for a new post-war world, they called the Airspeed Ambassador the Elizabethan, distinguishing them as their own prestigious class of aircraft. There weren't that many of them built, and British European Airways retired them in 1958. From then, a number of these units were transferred to other airlines for different roles. This specific plane, registered as Golf Alpha Mike Alpha Delta, was constructed and first entered service with BEA. For passenger transport in 1950, in 1957 the plane was purchased by BKS for the same role. The aircraft continued to fly as a passenger plane for a further 10 years. It was in 1967 that the plane was withdrawn from passenger service and was completely overhauled and converted into a freighter plane. Except this wasn't just a standard cargo plane; it was converted to fulfill a very specific role, according to the documents. Positioned along the center of the cabin were eight horse boxes, four rows of two spanning the length of the cabin. This was an aircraft that was now designed with the purpose of transporting horses via the air. This plane was effectively converted into a flying stable. Now, equestrian air travel is a thing, and there are specialized containers to accommodate horses on planes today. Though it is perhaps unusual to convert a whole plane for this purpose, it's something that does happen, and the transport of horses was the Axton plane's only real function at that time. BKS used the plane on these special horse charters, and it was this aircraft that caught the eye of a certain wealthy businessman in the UK, William Hill. Now that is a name that some in the audience may think sounds a bit familiar. For you see, Mr. Hill had a long history in the gambling and sports betting business. Just two years prior to the plane crash in question, he opened his first William Hill bookmaking betting shop, a franchise that now has betting shops in towns and cities all over the country. In fact, these sorts of betting shops are everywhere in the UK. Naturally, Mr. Hill was one to take interest in horse racing. He owned and bred his own racehorses and wanted a way he could transport them easily from country to country. William Hill contacted BKS with a charter request to transport eight of his racehorses between France and the United Kingdom. BKS sent the Axton plane along with a flight crew to pick up the horses along with five grooms, that being someone who attends to a horse. The horse accommodation inside of the aircraft. Included some space for these individuals to be appropriately positioned to do their job. Flying as flight C six eight four five, the Airspeed Ambassador left Deauville in France at three thirty five in the afternoon, with an expected arrival time into Heathrow of about four thirty. On board were a total of eight people, 
plus a further eight horses. Mr. William Hill himself was not on the aircraft. In the flight deck were three crew members. In command of the prop liner was 48-year-old Captain Ernest Hand, a highly experienced captain of over 15,000 flight hours. He knew the airspeed ambassador well, even to the point he was actually a training captain on the plane. So not only was he a captain of the aircraft, but he also taught other pilots how to fly it. If there was anyone you'd want as your pilot in one of these things, it was Captain Hand. Second officer John Birchall was much younger at 29 years of age. He was only starting out his commercial flying career and had joined the airline just six months previously. His total flight hours amounted to just 609. 142 of those were in the Airspeed Ambassador. 43-year-old John Moody was serving in what could best be described as a loadmaster role. He had no responsibilities when it came to the operation of the actual plane. The aircraft only required two people to fly, it didn't have a flight engineer's position like other planes of the day. Instead, Moody was responsible for loading and unloading the aircraft of its cargo and supervising the flight's passengers on this occasion. The flight was uneventful as it cruised in the one-hour journey across the English Channel. It would appear that the pilots continued their flight unaware that anything was amiss. Little did they know that in the final moments of the flight, a catastrophic mechanical failure would occur with their plane out of sight. Hidden away in the left wing, metal fatigue over years of service was about to reach its breaking point. As the plane approached London, the pilots began descending from their cruising altitude of just 7,000 feet. The pilots were cleared for an approach onto what was labeled at the time as runway 28 right. This is runway 27 right today and is the northern runway at Heathrow, approaching from the east over the town of Hounslow. The flight crew performed their procedures as normal, configuring the plane for landing, including extending the flaps. And it is here, within the flap system, that the failure occurred. As a quick refresher, flaps are a critical secondary flight control surface. What the flaps effectively allow a pilot to do is create a bigger wing on command. The flaps, as you can see yourself as a passenger on a plane, extend from the trailing and leading edge of a wing to create a larger wing. The key thing to know here is that the flaps increase the lift output of the wing. The larger amount of lift therefore also reduces the aircraft's stall speed. The trade-off for that though is increased drag, which can slow a plane down, but it's not necessarily the flaps' main function. The flaps serve to increase the wing performance for takeoff and landing, so that a plane can perform optimally at slower speeds. Some planes have leading edge and trailing edge flaps, and even different types of flaps at that. But the physics stays the same regardless of the aircraft, and pretty much every aeroplane will have flaps. The Cessnas all the way up to the A380s, the flaps will make a plane behave a certain way regardless of size. On command from the pilot in the cockpit, an actuator system, whether that be through hydraulics, electrics, or pulleys, the flaps can be extended and retracted as the pilot desires. Going back to our accident flight now, with flight C6845 within view of the airport, the pilots began their final approach. The pilots extended the flaps to the 30 degree position without issue. All was well with the plane as it got closer to the runway. 30 degrees of flap on the airspeed ambassador was considered to be the approach position, but there was still one stage of flap left, the maximum 40 degree landing flaps. In the final stage of the flight, as the aircraft was just a few hundred feet from the ground and approaching Heathrow Airport's runway 28 right, Captain Hand called for flaps 40. As the hydraulic system began actuating the flaps to the 40 degree position, Within the left wing, the flap rod, that being the component the flaps are actually connected to, broke. Metal fatigue over the years had reached a critical point on this flight. The aluminum flap rod snapped and the flaps on the left side no longer functioned as intended. Now this failure itself did not cause the crash that followed, but rather it enabled an environment where the following events could unfold. You see, even though the left flap system had suffered a failure, the right side was still intact and should have worked normally. The Airspeed Ambassador has a compensator system that is supposed to prevent asymmetrical deployment of the flaps. 
However, this was not designed with fractures or failure of the flap rod in mind. The compensating system was to account for variation of hydraulic pressure, not structural failure. Now the compensator system was left intact following the failure. Instead of the left flaps no longer working, what happened instead was the left flaps began to retract. But that's not all. To put it simply, a lot of the electrohydraulic mechanisms related to the flap system, including the locking of the flaps, were only connected to just the left side flaps. The right side borrowed the left's mechanics. As the flaps had become unsynchronized, and with a command already given to lower the right flaps to the landing position, the right flaps did not move in synchronization with the left. So what this meant was that when Captain Hand extended the flaps to the desired 40 degrees for landing, and consequently when the failure occurred, the right flaps went beyond the maximum operating limit into a region of 50 degrees of flap, whilst the left flaps were retracting, an environment of asymmetrical lift was created, leading to loss of control. Naturally, because the right wing was now larger than the left, that side was generating more lift, leading into a natural bank. The pilots were likely left confused at this moment as the plane began to drift left of the runaway extended centerline. It was as if the plane had entered an uncommanded left turn. Remember, this was only just a few moments from when they were expected to touch down. Needless to say that this failure couldn't have occurred at a worse point in the flight. Now within the airport's boundaries, two things occurred at this time. One, the left side landing gear had actually touched down onto the airport's ground, off the runaway, on the grass. Two, the pilots basically attempted to execute a go-around. Captain Hand increased engine power and brought the plane back into the air. It was at this time when filmmaker Frank Mills, positioned near to the runaway, pointed his camera toward the plane and began rolling. The captain was now experiencing immense difficulty in controlling his plane. It's unknown if he ever realized what had actually happened to the aircraft, but investigators believed that with such little time and limited information in that time, he acted as best he could. The only way to remove this asymmetry was for the flap lever to be set to zero. That would have brought the right flaps back in, in symmetry with the left. Evidence in the wreckage suggested that the pilots tried to bring the flaps back to 10 degrees, which was the normal position for takeoff and go around. The problem is that they didn't have the time. It would have taken a total of 25 seconds at least for the flaps to respond to this. There was perhaps also a different issue here. As the plane was in its landing state, it had a slow airspeed. Retraction of the flaps would have brought the plane outside of its flight envelope if it didn't have the sufficient airspeed. What we can see in the film here is an attempt by the pilots to raise the nose, only for them to not be in a position to clear the ground obstacles in time, the terminal building and apron filled with other planes. Investigators later suggested that given the state of the plane and the circumstances of the failure, the accident was unavoidable. Now because the aircraft was in a left bank, this brought the plane over to where Terminal 1 was located. In fact, the area the plane crashed into was partly under construction works. The aircraft impacted the terminal site, which was occupied by numerous construction workers and other employees of British European Airways, none of whom were injured in the accident. The nearby apron also contained a number of other aircraft, including multiple Hawker Siddeley Tridents and a Vickers Viscount. The Viscount received minimal damage and was later returned to service. The two Tridents suffered significant damage to their tail sections. One was rendered completely destroyed in the accident. The other had its tail fin sliced off. These planes were just parked here. No one was on board. There were no fatalities or injuries linked to these planes. There were also no ground injuries or fatalities from those nearby on the ground. Upon impact, the three flight crew members and three of the five groom passengers perished. Unbelievably, there were two human survivors in the crash. Almost immediately, the nearby bystanders of construction workers and airline employees arrived on the scene to assist the survivors. They were both rescued and lived. Of the eight horses on board the aircraft, seven died in the accident. One horse actually survived the crash. However, upon receiving care from a vet, their injuries were deemed to be too severe, 
and the horse was later euthanized. The findings of the investigation that followed prompted an immediate check of the flap rods on all remaining airspeed ambassadors in service at that time. The airspeed ambassador was actually a plane that was heading towards retirement at that time. Not many of them were built to begin with, and in a new age of brand new turboprops and jets, piston prop liners like this were facing the history books. The crash at Heathrow Airport was the last time one of these planes was lost. With the loss of a number of his racehorses, William Hill retired from the gambling business in 1970, and died one year later in 1971. BKS Air Transport retired the Airspeed Ambassador and acquired some newer planes. The airline would rebrand in 1970 as Northeast Airlines, which really was only short-lived as this was consolidated into British Airways in 1976. And that was the end of that. But, remember that one Trident that was involved in the crash? That was just parked at Heathrow? but had its tail sliced off in the accident? Well, believe it or not, this aircraft was actually repaired and was returned to service, where it continued to fly for British European Airways. This Trident, registered as Golf Alpha Romeo Papa India, suffered an even more unfortunate fate. This was the plane that crashed outside of Staines, nearby to Heathrow Airport, on June 18, 1972, as British European Airways Flight 548. A further 118 people died that day. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like and subscribe as there will be another video dropping next weekend. This was an interesting one. I stumbled across it whilst looking through the accidents we looked at on the Tridents a little while back. And then I found out about the film footage and it just made sense that I needed to make this video. Anyway. It is that time of the week once again where I must take a moment to thank my amazing patrons over on Patreon for their amazing ongoing support to the channel. Their names are on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, a massive thanks to you. Shoutouts this week go to Jamie Willerton and Isaac, who actually increased their pledge from last week to the highest tier. What a legend. Thank you both so very much. If you, yourself, would like to support the channel further, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below, along with a link to my personal Twitter page. All patrons get early access to all new content, two days before it goes out publicly on YouTube. That is all for me this week. If you want more Disaster Breakdown content, you can check out some of the videos that should be on the screen right now. Otherwise, I shall see you next week. Goodbye!